Okay, I think it's time we get going this morning. Uh, if ever we needed prayer before a Sabbath school, it's today. So why don't we uh, close our eyes and let's have prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are going to be discussing today the biggest event that's ever happened or will ever happen in the universe. And we ask that you will send the Holy Spirit because truthfully there is so much here uh, that we need to understand and there's been so much misinformation about this that we will need the Holy Spirit to clear the fog away and help us concentrate and be able to see the beauty of what you have done to reclaim the human race. In thy name, amen. Okay, today, Lecture 9, The Plan of Salvation, Part 2, Christ's Death. We've been working all these prior weeks, we've been working up to get to today. Now, it is true that after today, we have the one final mountain, and that's what does Christ do, what does God do to the people who turn down his gracious offer in the end? And that is the final chapter. But the final chapter never could have occurred if what we're going to talk about today had not happened. So this is, you know, Willie, I like to quote the Willie Sutton story. And you ask Willie Sutton, who was a bank robber, why do you rob banks? And he says, because that's where the money is. Well, here's where the money is. This, if, if we didn't have this lecture topic today, all of the other top lectures could just fade away. They wouldn't mean a thing. So this is it. We're, we're at ground zero here. We're going to review last time, because remember last time we talked about the fact, we asked the question, did Christ have to come and live? Couldn't he just come down and die and get the job done? If all we're doing is an exchange transaction, what God the Father is after is just a death, principally Christ's. Does it really matter when it happens or where it happens? If it's an exchange transaction, let's just have the, make the exchange transaction and be done. Why does he have to come as a child? Why does he have to be born of Mary? Why does he have to go through the 40 days in the wilderness, for goodness sakes? Why, why, why? Well, last time around, we found out that actually there was very important reasons why Christ had to come and live on this earth. How, why he had to be born of the mother? How else could he be in our shoes if he didn't have the same start that we did? Remember we talked about all the mobile genetic elements in the womb and how that that's the number one manufacturer sites for mobile genetic elements and how the little developing zygote embryo fetus is going to be completely inoculated with them and there's no way that that child can't. Christ came through the same thing we did. So we, in the end, and we'll talk about this on my last lecture on December 14, Every knee will bow, and it bows not because God forces them to bow, but because after looking at the evidence, it's so overwhelming, they have to say, you were right. I'm outside of the city, and it's my fault, all my fault. None of it's yours. So in order for that to happen, Christ has to actually go in, into our shoes, and he has to walk the entire from A to Z, the entire course. Uh, Christ came into our world after the adversary had introduced his varied information weaponry. Remember, we talked last time that mobile genetic elements didn't all come on the scene at one time. They came in waves, sequentially. And that was, prop we posted the idea that possibly Christ came so late in this conflict because he was waiting for the devil to introduce all of his weaponry so that when Christ came when he was able to find an answer to all of this he would have had all of what the devil was going to do on the table for him to work with. The three wilderness temptations were engineered to appeal to the three main areas that the devil utilizes to tempt humanity into using mobile genetic element controlled brain circuitry. That's a lot of fancy talk for this for saying it this way. The devil has three main areas in the brain where he has captured the circuitry. Three main areas where he can come and present to us 
the advantages, quote unquote, of using his circuitry, and we have a natural disposition to want to listen to him and to want to do it. We don't have to, but we like to hear it, okay? And um, we toy with it. We think about doing it. You know what I'm talking about? Everyone in this room's had, this should be no sh shock or surprise to any of you. There's three main ways and the three main temptations Christ had to overcome in the wilderness, touched on all three, and not only touched on all three, was probably the, um, the zenith of the way that the devil could present it to somebody. It was the best package deal he could present to make Christ bite. Christ's stated objectives in coming to this world were to destroy what the enemy had made and in the process destroy the adversary's influence on this earth and destroy any sympathy for him throughout the rest of God's creation. Now, today we're going to really be talking about what happened on the cross, but think about this for a moment. You have to take what the Bible says, look at it carefully from beginning to end. When it talks about why Christ had to come and why he had to die, for most of the, if not all of the, Christian denominations out there at the present time, Christ had to come and die as an exchange. He exchanged his death for ours, and because he was God, or he is God, he, his death is worth a lot more than just one of ours, so he could exchange for everybody. That's the, if you drill down on most every single Christian denomination out there, at the bottom of where you get to how are we saved, you're going to come to this type of an idea or some variant of it. But as we're going to see today in the Bible, and as I'm reminding you of what we saw last week, the Bible really doesn't say that anywhere. And today we're going to find out why did people come up with that idea, or at least we're going to Look at some of the reasons why they came up with the idea. Now, the major thing that we covered last week, as far as I'm concerned, um, dealing with this whole topic, is remember in John 15, verses 1 through 9, Christ says, you want to know what salvation is like? It's like this. I'm the vine, and you are the branches, and you're grafted on to me. And this was well known to the Jewish nation because the Jewish nation always symbolized themselves as a grape vine growing up. And that on the, on the side of their temple, they would have beautiful, pure gold, grape vine type uh, trellis going up the side of the temple. So this was well known to them. And remember we talked last week about the fact that in tomato plants, they were uh, doing a lot of experiments at the end of, like, you know, in the 1990s, and what they discovered was that when tomato plants would get a virus, why the, they would quit making tomatoes, they would become sickly, and some of them would even die. And they thought, well, what can we do to stop this infestation? How can we turn around and make our crops more productive? And in doing that, they did the experiments when they would take a branch from an infected plant. This is a plant that's got, we call it a transgene, but for our purposes, we could just call it a mobile genetic element. Transgene, that means a transfer gene in. What do mobile genetic elements do? They move genetic information in, so let's just call it a mobile genetic element. It gets into a plant, the plant's in trouble. You can take one of the branches of that plant, and if you can go find another tomato plant, which has somehow overcome the disease, it was infected with it, but it was able to find in its own immune system a way to bottle up the disease and shut it up. If you graft on the infected branch to the, to the tomato plant, which has got, we call it, it's a silenced plant, meaning it silenced the transgene, guess what happens to the, the branch that's grafted on? Disease goes away, starts making tomatoes. But if you take that branch that you grafted on and put it back on the original tree, it dies. 
And what, what we found out that the reason that occurs is because in the stalk part, the main part of the plant that's overcome the disease, the silence plant, it's making microRNAs that go up through the phloem, it's called, up into the whole, the rest of the tomato plant. And those microRNAs are, go up there and they silence the transgene. We're going to talk today how it does that again. So it goes up there in this new added genetic material, shuts it down, locks it up, keeps it from being transcribed, keeps it from being read. And the other interesting thing we talked about is you can actually take a 30 sonometer section of a, another tomato plant that's not infected, has nothing to do with this whole system, and graft it in between the the graft that you took that was sick from the sick plant and the healthy stock, and it still shuts down the transgene in the infected graft. And I suggested to you what this tells us is, is this is how the Holy Spirit can actually con carry this information. We're going to talk today to it. Says it can actually, this information can be transported. It can be transported. If the stock had it, had the disease, overcame it, puts out this special microRNA, it can travel long distances, it can travel through conduits to where it has to go, and it can work. And it does work. Now, I don't think Christ picked this example by accident. I don't think he was walking around and thinking, ah, here's a great plant, this, this probably would work. I think Christ knew exactly that this was a perfect example of salvation, and I'm going to go a step further. It's my firm belief he knew we'd be talking about this very subject today. He knew we, at, at, at this time in history, that we could go into science and find out exactly how that worked, and I don't think it was accidental. I think it was on purpose. This is just a reminder of microRNAs. I know I'm throwing a lot of genetic stuff at you, but if I keep bringing it up every week, we're going to bring it up next week, you're going to start becoming familiar with it. Remember, they're 19 to 23 nucleotide bases long. They start out with these what we call hair print pin, um, circular kind of a loop around up there. And the uh, drosia in the nucleus, the top part is the nucleus. You see that wavy line at the very top? That represents the DNA, the chromosomes. And uh, let me see if I can get this to work. There, ah. There's the wavy lines, that's the chromosomes. See this hairpin? Funny looking thing that's transcribed off of there with this special drosia, big, big enzyme. Trims it, gets it ready, sends it out to the, to the cytoplasm, where dicer, another big protein, trims it further, cuts off just a certain portion. And how it knows what part to cut off, nobody knows. It's a mystery. And then it combines up with something called an argonaut protein, which is like a handler. And I, was, I lost my... Here it is. It's like a handle. Right here, the argonaut protein, you see it there? And now that argonaut protein will go back into the nucleus, and with this microRNA as a template, it can go hunting, for instance, and find the regulatory element that was made by the mobile genetic element. It can go up there and hunt and find it, and it can do a number of things to stop that from being implemented. It can shut it down, it can, or it can take the, the part that's transcribed from it, edit it, cut it up into pieces, send it somewhere else. It can do anything. It's the ultimate editor. And here's just some quotes. It says, finally, microRNAs repress most of the genes they regulate by just a tiny amount, yet collectively, microRNAs affect nearly all cellular pathways from uh, development to oncon oncogenesis. We have, our cells are teeming with microRNAs. And microRNAs usually function, generally speaking, by numbers. You can have microRNAs that want to promote um, 
uh, a, uh, a certain activity. We'll call it activity A. And you can have other microRNAs that try to inhibit the function of ac activity A. Whether activity A is going to happen or not depends on numbers. If there's more of them that are against than are for, it's going to not happen. If there's more that are for it than that are against it, it won't happen. You see how it is? And you have multiple systems, thousands of them, bringing in microRNAs that in some way or another will influence any single, um, most of the major metabolic pathways in the cell. Are, it, they will be influence them in some way. So all parts of the genome are talking to all other parts of the genome, and it is a plurality that wins. So we have a system here, or I'm going to suggest to you, where there's a vast amount of microRNAs, we know where, they're, where they are, they're coded from mobile genetic elements, which are promoting brain circuitry for us to be working with what the devil has presented as his alternative way of doing things, but God has his sources of microRNA in our genome, and there is where the fight is, you see? And guess who's going to be the arbiter? Who's going to decide which side's going to be making more of these microRNAs? That's you, and that's me. The human genome alone comprises of 1,500 hairpin structures. This was published in August of 2013. They're discovering more and more and more. I, 1,500 is old hat now. They've just caught on to these. They've got, they're really, many labs around the world are looking at them, and the numbers are going up. So when you see the number 1,500, don't think, oh, well, they found them all. We've just started. Uh, selective pressure during evolution seemed to have maintained the pairing between microRNAs and more than half of all human protein coding genes, suggesting that these tiny riboregulators control the expression of most human proteins. They're being conservative. Here's a prediction. They, they will find that microRNAs control all human proteins. But they can't say that because we have so many to look at. But every protein that comes up to, to be examined is heavily influenced by microRNAs. So yes, we can't make a dogmatic statement, but I'll bet you that that's true. Remember this slide. This was looking at the microRNA patterns in a number of body secretions. And remember when we were talking, for instance, about becoming one flesh, we were looking over at the um, vaginal secretions on the left, and then the seminal secretions right next to it, and then sal I mean, salivary is next to it, then seminal, and the SEs are seminal. And then finally, we looked at menstrual blood, which is MS2, MS3, and MS1. Now, starting from there over, you see the WB7, WB3, WB1, WB2, etc. That's whole blood. WB stands for whole blood. And as you look at these, as you just look at each line that goes up, red means you have a lot of those microRNAs that they were looking for. They, they got a, a cross section of microRNAs and said, hey, let's see how these show up in all the different body fluids. But notice that the WB, so that's the last six on, as you're looking on your right, as you look up, you notice that the pattern is much different than anything else you're going to see up there. And that's because blood carries more microRNAs than anything. It is the main communication. Remember last week, we, in Leviticus 17, it says you're not to eat the blood because that is the life of the animal is in the blood. It's yes, the blood does carry oxygen and take away waste and CO2 and all of the other things, but the most well, how can you pick what's the most important? One of its most important duties is it is the internet of the body. Because the microRNAs, these exosomes, are put out into the blood. It's loaded with them. And it's just like uh, in the internet, you type in a certain address, sends it out into the bloodstream, and the bloodstream delivers it to the right organ and to the right cells. And it's got an address on the exosome, and it goes right into the cell, and it does what it's supposed to do. So the blood does a very absolutely necessary function. If you stop and think for a minute, how are you going to keep 100 trillion 
120 trillion cells working together. 120 trillion cells have to work together to be you. That takes an enormous amount, enormous, an enorm, an enormous amount of communication at the genetic level, turning gene sy systems on and off. So whoever owns the microRNA system owns the organism. Where do you think, if there's a fight between good and evil, where do you think we're going to see the battle? You're going to go for the gold. Whoever owns this owns everything. So wouldn't you imagine this is where the battle's going to be fought, won or lost? Well, let's move forward. <coughs> MicroRNAs clusters are often expressed in tissue development or tissue specific manner and modify the expression of many genes acting as a master switch. I like that word master because you know what that tells you? It can override almost everything else. We have many systems in the body hundreds, thousands that deal with the genome and, and interplay between the different genes, co protein coding areas, trying to make uh, this wonderful organism that we, we live, that we call our bodies. But somewhere along the line, somebody has to have the final say. And it's these guys. They can override this, this is called epigenetics. They, they, they're put into the broad category of ep epigenetics. They can override congenital inherited diseases. Not all of them. Not cystic fibrosis or, th or, or things of that nature, but other lesser, how do I put this, leather, other genetic diseases which um, many of them deal in the microRNA system, but you may have a code to do, for instance, eye color. This get, microRNAs can come in and change things. They can edit it. So guess what we're going to do? From here on out, we're going to be looking at microRNAs. Remember Willie Sutton? That's where the money is. Let's go there. How did Christ obtain the microRNAs that are able to combat mobile genetic elements in their products? So you see what the battle is. The mobile genetic elements code for microRNAs. Lots of them. And next week, they were, uh, I'm not here next week. Dr. Webster, you're going to get a real lecture next week. But when I come back, when we pick this back up again, we're going to see that there is an incredible war going on in the microRNA system. Very ingenious stuff has been made, weaponry, as they go back and forth on this issue. Um, so how did Christ obtain the ability to take on these, this scourge of the microRNAs? The microRNAs are making, I mean the, I'm sorry, mobile genetic elements are the scourge, and they're the ones that are making microRNAs, and God's DNA, and I'm simplifying this, and I'm talking very teleologically because I'm trying to take some con very um, detailed stuff and make it more palatable. So we've got two sides that are making microRNAs, and I'm going to give you a hint. Those microRNAs are going after each other. And remember, numbers win, and who in the end determines the numbers? We do. For it became him from whom all are, are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of there that there is us, humans, salvation perfect through sufferings. Now I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you to be thinking as we're going to, so we're going to be going into Bible text. I thought Christ was already perfect when he was born. I thought he was perfect all the way through. Am I misreading this text?
Well, let's see. Maybe it gets better. Maybe we'll find a text that will help us out. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cries and tears to him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. It doesn't say because he was perfect. This is text number two now. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to them that obey him. Something he had to do when he came down here, and we haven't defined perfect yet, and we're going to. So just rest for a moment. You, you may be surprised at the definition of perfect. When he was made perfect, at that point he could become the author of eternal, that means forever, whatever he comes up with is permanent, to all of those that obey him. <coughs> but he was wounded for our transgression, transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was on him, and with his stripes we are healed. Remember the plant? Remember the plant? The tomato plant? It had to have had the transgene infection. Or you could not, if you took an infected branch that you were going to graft on, if it had not had the infection and overcome it, it was no help in, in grafting on. It would, do, it would get you nowhere. These are Christ's own examples now. We're using what he put in there. He could have chosen anything he wanted as an example. He had to have known what he was doing. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Remember what we've said all along. Iniquities, when you read it here in this paradigm, in the... In the genome paradigm, iniquities equal mobile genetic elements. Remember that? Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. That means, that's another way of saying, he was right there with the transgressors. He was no different. That's a Hebrew way of saying, same. He's right there with them because he is one of them. And he bore the sin. Now the word sin there is not the usual sin that we find referred to in the, uh, the, the Jewish word, and we'll see in a moment. Uh, its root means to miss the mark. Now the, the Greek word is, is, is different. The, the, deep, the Greek word has... Um, at, at, it, its deep roots, can, you can trace it back there too, but it's a slightly different word. It, yeah, it's hamartia. But in this case, the sin, is it, when you look at the root for that Hebrew word, it really means penalty. So we could, we could legitimately read this, and he bore the penalty of many and made intercession, and the Greek, I mean, and the Hebrew word here for intercession, the, the base of that word is to hit the mark. So if in, in Hebrew, for sin, you miss the mark. Intercession, you hit the mark. So let's put this in there again. He bore the penalty of many and made, and made it hit the mark for their transgressions. Sorry we had to get down into the roots of words, but they tell us a lot. And the translators do the best they can, and I'm thankful for them. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't go back and say, well, let's look at the words ourselves and see what, what we can come. Now, considering what we're talking about today, if you're awake, and I hope you are, you're going to see where I'm going with this. He had to take on our, and I'm going to use my words, our disease. He had to come up with a response to our disease. And that's what he's going to use, this knowledge is what he's going to use, use to save the human race. Now, people are, I know what some of you have to be thinking, but God knows everything. But my, my question to you is, how does he know everything? 
Does he have to look and study things just like we do? Or does he know everything all the time, period? In which case, another question comes up. If God knows everything ever that can happen, will happen, and he just knows it without having to go out and find it out just like we do, not just like we do, he has ways way above what we do, but I, I was using this as an analogy. If God has all the information that could ever be, then why would he create, why would he bother creating? Couldn't he just sit there and go, I'm imagining creating the earth. Oh, wow, that was a great one. I see the whole thing. Okay, I don't need to do that anymore. Let's move on. Here's a thought for you. Do I think God knows everything? I think God knows everything that's knowable. Can God create a situation where he doesn't know the outcome? If you say no, then he's not omnipotent. If you say yes, then he doesn't know everything. Take your pick. For just this argument, for our, no, it's not an argument, it's a discussion, I hope. For, this, for our discussion today, let's just assume that God can know everything in this earth because he has access to time travel, okay? He can go forward and backward. But that still means that what happens has to happen, or traveling ahead in time doesn't make any difference. Or traveling behind in time doesn't make any difference if it didn't happen. So it has to happen, and, if, and for him to get the information, it has to occur somewhere, sometime. If it never occurs, then it's just his imagination, and then we get into all kinds of trouble about what are we doing here, and are we just a figment of God's imagination? It, it gets to an, an unending vortex of unknowns, and people walk out shaking their head and go, I don't want to deal with this anymore. So we're just going to try to make it simple and make some simple ideas and rules that we're going to live with. So let's say that God can go backwards and forwards in time, and he does. Because remember, we quoted Revelation 13, 8, which says that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, which tells me that God had to use some of the information that he's going to pick up on the cross earlier. But he had to go to the cross and have the cross happen in order to get it. He had to do the cross in order to understand what the ramifications of the cross was. All right, what does the word perfect mean? Yeah, I'm gonna, I don't want to go there yet. I'm going to talk for this a second. I heard a sermon one time where the pastor got up, and he was quoting Matthew 5.48, and we're going to see that in a moment, where it says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And he says, well, how many of you out here are perfect? And of course, there's a lot of teetering and laughing. He goes, I don't see any hands. And he goes, do you really think that God meant this statement for us? Or was he using hyperbole? Because if you're perfect, that means you never get up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom and stub, and stub your foot because it's dark. You wouldn't be perfect. And how many of us could ever say that we weren't going to do that. This last week I wasn't watching on Tuesday morning and I, there was some ice and I didn't see it. Next thing I know I was flat on the ground. See, I'm not perfect. And so the pastor then went ahead to make this um, straw man argument that God couldn't want us to be perfect. Obviously, none of us can. So get this idea of being perfect out of your mind. Can't happen. Doesn't mean it. Very poor argument. Very easily dealt with. And we're going to deal with it now. For it became him from whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And remember we asked earlier, I thought Christ was perfect when he came down. Well, Remember, he had to have mobile genetic elements, so right there he's not, his genome's not going to be perfect, 
But we're going to have some text pretty soon that he was a lamb without spot. So that means his behavior and his thinking was without defect. Okay, so that's going to, we can start bringing in these facts as we're looking it over. But something is occurring here. And we've got to, let's see if we can find out by looking around and drawing what we've already talked about over the last couple of weeks and see if we can put it together and come with some meaningful um, explanation to these things. Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Okay, let's take this. Remember, we're taking the Bible literally. Let's, let's look at this literally for a moment. What could you and I do that would be perfect? If God's saying he wants us to be perfect, okay? We haven't finished defining it yet, but let's, let's look at the parameters that we're dealing with. If God wants us to be perfect, what could we do that, just like him, and be able to do it as well as he does. Well, some people say we could love others. We're not going to be able to love others as well as he does. A parent has the number one ability to love the child over anyone else in the, that's going to come along. Just ask a parent. It's going to win, hands down. Well, how else could we be perfect like him? Maybe we could create worlds. No, that probably wouldn't work. Uh, we can create human beings. No, we don't create them. We procreate them. He gives us the ability to, to combine our information system with someone else, so that doesn't work. Maybe we could predict the future like him. No, that's not going to work. How could we be perfect like him? Really now? In what way, what could they be looking for? Well, the word perfect means having no mistakes or flaws, completely correct or accurate, or having all the qualities you want in that kind of a person. We're just looking at, is this, is this uh, Thayer or is this uh, Brown? Webster, Webster, Webster. Webster, Webster. Webster. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Webster. <laughs> How can we do something perfect just like God? Well, guess what? Let's read this text. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempts he any man. Now, here's an interesting thought. It says that God's perfect. We're to be perfect like God is. We go to James, and he tells us God cannot be tempted by evil. I wonder if we could be the same. The only function that we can do just like God is not respond to evil. But this can only happen if God empowers us to do so. I and them, and you and me, that they may be, be, that they may be made perfect in one. And the Greek word means mature or complete or comes to its final edited um, piece. It's done. It's something, you've made a masterpiece, it's mature, it's done, it's perfect. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as, as you have, as, and loved them as you have loved me. Search me, God, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, cast down imaginations, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He didn't say some thoughts, or he didn't say most of the time. And if the Bible says... You're to do it, a, pro, a, a requirement is a, also a promise. God never asks you and me to do something that it's impossible for us to do. The minute he does that, the devil wins. This whole civil war is over. Give it to the devil. It's done. Because that was one of his main arguments. Perfect equals mature, nothing to respond to the devil. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, 
he became the author of eternal salvation to all of them that obey him. Hereafter, now what does Christ say at the very end? Three, three days before, or right, the last week before he's going to be crucified. What, he makes a very important statement. He says, hereafter, I will not talk much with you. In fact, this is, this is Thursday night before he's going to go out to Gethsemane. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. If you look at the Greek, in other words, the devil can come to him now with any temptation, and there's nothing in Christ that even flickers to give it a second thought. He makes this statement now at the very end. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that his sufferings, 40 days in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil, and his other sufferings, being tempted by the devil, pushed Christ finally came to the place where he said, even though, uh, let me back up, when we were talking about those three temptations in the wilderness, they wouldn't have been a temptation if Christ had no interest in doing them, would they? If I come up to you in this room and I say, I would like to tempt you to do hang gliding, but I want, you, I want to push you off a cliff, and I know you haven't done it before, but it's fun. What about it? How many of you would say, sign me up? I don't need any of that education stuff. This looks great. This is something I really want to do. How many of you would be debating with yourself saying, man, I know, I don't know, I really want to do it. What should I do? Let me call, let me call someone, a friend and ask them what they think. Would it be tempting to you? Or to bungee jump off the Empire State Building? Would that be tempting to you? Would that be something that you go, mm. I've been wanting to do that. I'm telling you. So that wouldn't be a temptation then, would it? I'd be sort of stupid to bring it up, wouldn't I? You'd wonder a little bit about me. I wonder, I don't know if I saw him coming in to give my anesthetic. I probably would cancel my surgery. I know what you're thinking. He's trying to promote stuff like this? In order for it to be a temptation, there's got to be something inside of you that goes... Yeah, I'm resonating with that. So to say Christ went out and was tempted three times in the wilderness, if there wasn't something resonating in him, it wasn't a temptation. What is he saying here at the very end? He's going, guess what? The devil, there's nothing he can bring to me anymore that has the slightest bit that resonates in me. And if Christ had mobile genetic elements... He's going to have to deal with brain circuitry like we did. And what this tells me, and I wasn't there, I can't prove it, I'm now throwing out an idea. and you Just something for you to think about. Christ had come to the place where he had brought his, the, the, he had brought his entire system so that everything he thought about and wanted to do had only to do for the glory of God to the point where Everything the devil might come and bring in front of him, whether it's, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, or why don't you go out and make a big name for yourself by jumping off the temple, has no effect on him at all now. None. There's nothing to resonate inside of him. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins... How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? I'm going to make a suggestion. I wasn't there. I don't know. Just like the illustration of the plant, and it has to make microRNAs against this transgene that comes in, Whatever Christ did, and at this point we don't know and we may never know, he was able to develop the microRNAs to shut down mobile genetic elements. And at this point, right before he's going to be killed, sacrificed, he has completed the work. And he says to the Father, and he's saying, he's saying it to the universe when he's, the disciples didn't know what he was saying. But the onlooking universe did when he said, the devil comes to me and he, there is nothing in me that responds to him, him anymore. What he's saying is the first part of what I came to do is completed. We now have a way to 
I now have developed a way to completely counteract what all these mobile genetic elements are doing with all their microRNAs and their messenger RNAs and all the other things that they've done to totally confuse the picture. I've got it. I've found them all. I have got something to rebut them all. And guess where those are going to be flowing in Christ? What's the communication pathway? The blood. Now, when I was growing up, I always thought, oh, it's the blood of Christ which saves us. I thought, well, it's a wonderful allegory. It's a metaphor, I'm sure. I've gone 180 degrees. I think, no, that's exactly accurate. It's not the blood exactly itself. It's what the blood's carrying. That's what we're in desperate need of. Just like the tomato plant that has to be grafted on from the infected plant to the, to the plant that's no longer infected. It's the transgene is silenced. That's why you're not to eat the blood of animals. Because it's loaded with these microRNA that the animal is sending out to all of its cells to be a cow. And it'll go into your DNA and it will tell your DNA to be a cow. It'll try to. Now you have your own microRNAs. Remember, this is a number thing, numbered uh, thing. But if you eat enough of a cow, you get enough microRNAs, you're going to get some changes. And people do. They gain weight. They put the weight on here. Because that's what it, your cells are being told to do. We're going to get to the purge your conscience further in a moment. So I'm just putting up here. Notice what it says the blood of Christ will do. It will purge your conscience. Christ offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We have redemption in his blood, in his blood, or through his blood. What's in there? We don't actually have Christ's blood available to us right now. And I know our Catholic friends would disagree with me on this, but... If you don't allow for transubstantiation, we don't have his blood available. But what could we have that's in the blood that is available? And that's where we're going to go in further. Here it just tells you that microRNAs can regulate synapses in your brain. That's big. Let me say that again. MicroRNAs, no matter where you get them, can alter the synapses in your brain. Now, let's just remember, what were we supposed to do? We were supposed to bring our thoughts into captivity to Christ. Isn't that what we were told to do? Could you or I do it if we sat here and said, okay, let's just, try, uh, let's just think good thoughts, think good thoughts, think, think good thoughts. Remember, the brain, 64% of the brain is aneuploid. That means that... It's got one too many or one too few chromosomes, and that that affects its function, obviously deleteriously. We need help. We need someone to come in and give us a patch. You can't do it, and I can't do it. And that's where we're going to get next week to some of those. Not next week. I keep sorry. I won't be here. Uh, where we, we're going to look at those texts, which Ephesians 2.8, you know, it's not by works or anything you've done. It's all through the grace of God. And then people have decided, well, we don't have to do anything then. This is great. Or could they be misreading that text that what it's really referring to is, you and I can't come up with these microRNAs. We don't have them. Someone or some buddy has got to import this information into us so we can work on our brains and change us. It says the regulation of synapse formation and plasticity in the developing and adult, both, brain underlies a complex interplay of intrinsic genetic programs and extrinsic factors. Recent research identified microRNAs, a class of small non-coding RNAs, as a new functional layer in this regulatory network. Very recent data 
further provide insight into activity-dependent regulation of microRNAs, thereby, thereby connecting microRNAs with adaptive processes of neuronal circuits. Lecture three, we talked about circuitry, remember? I spent a lot of time on circuitry, probably confused a few people. That's why I keep coming, trying to bring it back so we can keep talking over some of these complex ideas. What this is saying is microRNAs can affect synapses and in the process affect circuitry. And remember, they can turn things off or turn them on, or they can alter them. Remember, it says, my servant in Isaiah 53, well, through his, 5311, through his knowledge, he will be able to justify many. That means to make righteous. That, that Hebrew word means to make righteous. He will make many right. It's another way of saying it. Through his knowledge, he will make many right. And the many, I looked it up this morning, it means a whole, it, it means inclusive. Anyone who wants to come in. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. In other words, you can't be saved by works. If you go out and do something repetitively here or there, or you go to Mecca, or you go to a shrine, that's not going to save you. That has nothing to do with doesn't get to where the problem is. The problem is in the brain. It's in the circuitry. If you're going to go after this problem, that's where you have to go. Willie Sutton, that's where the money is. It's in the bank. And the only thing that I have been able to find in all of science that does that is these guys, the microRNAs. And it fits in with the uh, vine, doesn't it? Uh, it does. I'll tell you that. You can look up please look up those articles and read it because when you read the articles it, it's like it's like well someone who believed in this theory sat down and wrote them except the guys writing it have no idea we're using this probably would be shudder and horror if they realized when I was using their scientific paper MicroRNAs comprise species of short non-coding RNA that regulate gene expression post-transcriptionally. Recent studies have demonstrated that epigenetic mechanisms, including DNA methylation and histone modification, not only regulate the expression of protein-coding genes, but also microRNAs. It gives a number of them. Conversely, another subset of microRNAs controls the expression of important epigenetic regulators, including DNA methyltransferases, histone deacetylases, and polycomb group genes. This complicated network of feedback between microRNAs and epigenetic pathways appears to form an epigenetic microRNA regulatory circuit. Seeing this now? I'm going to put this into English in a moment. I'm just trying to push, I want you to look at certain parts of it carefully to form an epigenetic microRNA cir regulatory circuit and to organize the whole gene expression profile. MicroRNAs are instrumental in being able to go and methylate parts of the genome and what are the parts of the genome that are methylated, are primarily methylated, or is the target of methylation is the regulatory elements that are mobile genetic elements. If you don't have the microRNAs, you can't shut them down. That's what they're saying. You need microRNAs in order to shut down the mobile genetic elements. And in two weeks when I come back, or three, um, we're going to talk about how the, mo the regulatory elements that are shut down by the, this good class of microRNAs, they make up a bunch of stuff to confuse, destroy, and otherwise obfuscate the situation so that the microRNAs that are coming to shut them down can't. And then they make their own microRNAs to go out there and they affect your brain circuitry. Are you starting to see the complexity of what we're dealing with here? And you're the final, you and I are the final arbiter of who's going to win. 
We hold those keys ourselves, personally, period. No one else has that authority, nor are they granted that ability. Remember heterochromatin? We talked about that. I think that was in four. Um, the, micro, uh, the microRNAs help to signal the parts of the genome that need to be completely encased in what is called histone proteins, and then they're all put together and they're shoved out in the nucleus to the side of the nucleus. You see where it says heterochromatin here? Let me get my little, there, right there. See that? See this dark stuff? It's, it's, it's dense DNA that's covered with protein and it's locked down. It can't be transcribed. You can't get in. And it's pri by and large primarily mobile genetic elements. Not entirely, but a large, large percentage of it is mobile genetic elements. And the cell does this to lock these mobile genetic elements up because if they get out and start transcribing, the cell dies. So you can't go in and just let that heterochromatin out. And actually, if I keep going here, we're going to, there was been one experiment where that happened. And we're going to go look at that. That's fascinating. So, you need to have microRNAs in order to form the heterochromatin, which binds up the mobile genetic elements and sends it out to the side of the nucleus where it can't cause any damage. No, mi no microRNAs, no heterochromatin. And all those mobile genetic elements can have a field day. And guess what? If those mobile genetic elements aren't cor corralled from the very first, there'd be no human beings because the zygote would never make it to an embryo. Summary. Christ had to take our genome with its microgenetic, mobile genetic elements, overcome their pull to commit certain behaviors, thoughts or actions, and make microRNAs which combat the mobile genetic elements' actions. By my servant's knowledge, he will make many right. The information which he obtained, he will use to make many right. My transgression is sealed up in a bag and you sew up my iniquity. Job, I believe, had a concept of what we're talking about. Look at that. You saw the picture of heterochromatin. It's all bound up pushed out to the side of the nucleus. Job says, my transgression is sealed up in a bag and you sew up my iniquity. Remember, whenever we see iniquity, we can, this is this paradigm says you can exchange mobile genetic elements. It's in the Bible. All of these illustrations that start to fit together purpose, perfectly, and I'm using the perfect, definition that we used this morning, uh, they couldn't have happened by chance, in my opinion. Do you think so? Do you think these statements through the Old Testament and the New Testament just, wow, we were lucky. <laughs> Look at that. I wonder if they really knew it. I wonder if they really complement each other. Hmm. I don't know. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as gold and silver, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. If the Holy Spirit, and how they do this, at a, I don't know, at a molecular level, is able to enable us to make the microRNAs we need to combat the mobile genetic element infestation that we've inherited and we've added to, we've aided and abetted it, then if the Holy Spirit was to take something from Christ, let's suppose he had a problem with gossiping. And he hadn't taken care of that mobile genetic element part because he enjoyed it himself. If he's partaking in it, he can't be making antibodies against it. He's promoting the mobile genetic elements. They start, remember hot spots? We talked about hot spots. Mobile genetic elements start multiplying. We don't know why. Scientists don't know why. I'm going to suggest to you it's because we're engaging in the behavior that those guys are there promoting. 
And Christ says so in the Bible, you can't serve God and man. It's, it's impossible. If you start serving mammon or the devil or his side, that's what you're going to do. That's who you're promoting. That's, their system is what's going to go grow and take over. And conversely, the opposite is true, vice versa. So if Christ had made a mistake, we wouldn't have coverage for that mistake. Game, set, match. Because if you leave some mobile genetic elements, if you don't, remember we looked at, we read in James that if you've broken, one, James 2.10, if you broke one commandment, you broke them all. Why? Because if you leave a little nest of these guys in there, guess what they do? They multiply. And they were given the name jumping genes because that's how they were discovered. They can jump to any chromosome anywhere in the nucleus, and not only can they, they want to, and they will. So either you get rid of everything, or you still have the disease, you just put it into remission for a little while, but uh, if you don't eradicate it, it's going to come back and it will kill you. And I'm going to show you proof that we actually have an experiment we can look at. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. What does this mean, be formed in us? Well, guess what? If we get his microRNA system, what are the, they're, the number, they're the top dogs, right? They do everything. They can do anything to the genome, right? I've shown you a lot of papers. Please just nod yes. <laughs> All those papers. If I've confused you with them, I could have showed you more. I kept myself to a minimum. We could have spent an hour, no, four hours looking at this, paper after paper after paper, until I would have been here by myself long before we would have got there. But at any rate, this is not a questionable fact I'm putting out here. This is well known. It's been researched by many labs. Everyone agrees. It's a fact, Jack. How else is Christ going to be formed in us if he doesn't take over the number one system, the number one information? Oh, there's that word again, information. The number one information system in the body is going to be the king, and he's got to take that over. Or we're done. So when Paul says, until Christ be formed in you, he means that. This isn't an allegory. And I, I hear pastors go, well, it's just allegorical. No, it's not. We're going to see it here real quickly. If he doesn't do that, we're in trouble. No, we're beyond trouble. We're done. We should just leave here today. This is all just a bunch of hot air from me. And I'll, you know, enough said. We now have a hypothesis of how heterochromatin is formed. Next, we need to decide, hey, we've got it there in the cell. It's all locked up, but how are we going to get it out? I have not showed you one way yet to get it out, have I? And I'm going to give you a little hint. Scientists have no clue. In fact, we're going to find out if you get it out, it's, it's been booby-trapped. If you try to go into a cell and remove the heterochromatin, the cell shuts down, dies immediately. It's been booby-trapped. So if you try to take this out, it's going to kill the cell. Ah, now am I, are you beginning to get an idea why maybe God had, Christ had to die? Was it necessary? Haven't you heard that before? People go, well, I don't think he really had to die. I think he died to show us he loved us. It does show he loves us, and I'm not in any way trying to cheapen that act. That it's, it is moving. And I say that reverently. It was incredible what he did. But I'm also going to say something else very reverently too. I've read many stories where in, in war, 
one soldier will throw himself on a grenade to save his buddies, and that's also a gruesome sight. If it was just to show that he loved us, would that really take care of the problem? Would it do anything to the mobile genetic elements that we've got inside? Yes, we should look at the cross and say, and I do, weekly, and I go, I can't believe he did it. I absolutely can't believe it did it. Yes, we should sit at the foot of the cross. We should contemplate. But not just the gruesome details of his physical <clears throat> sufferings. Because those were just minor compared to the real battle. And that's what we're going to look at today. Where was the real battle being fought? I love this co comment in Galatians 3.21, and I never hear anybody preach about it. And it says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life truly, righteousness should have been given by the law. In other words, if God could go and change the law, he would have. If, he, if there was a way the law could be a bridge, if there's, if there's a way he could write in a, a new proviso, he would have. But our problem required something that the changing the law couldn't do. We were infected with mobile genetic elements and changing the law to allow them to stay there is just going to keep the circuitry and we, we would continue on doing what we're doing. And you know the mobile genetic elements win at the end. That's aging. We die. So changing the rules isn't going to help us. And then I want you to think about something, because we're going to come to it. I just want to think about it. I'm putting a question on the table. If changing the rules won't help us, then why would Christ trading his death for ours save us? Isn't that changing the rules? We committed the sin. He trades. It's a, you know what I mean? It's a... Isn't that changing the rules? Aren't we told in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin pays its wage death? Sin pays it, not God. Sin pays it. And if that's the rules, then how does this exchange work? Or maybe there is an exchange, but we're looking at it in the wrong way. And what would that say about God the Father if he was willing to take the death of his son to let some people who weren't supposed to, who were in open rebellion come in? What would that tell you about breaking the rules? Just some questions. Could Christ's death have something to do with the MGE removal? We have two problems with that, with removing the MGEs. How can over two-thirds of our genome be removed, even if it's quote-unquote tied up in heterochromatin, uh, and have us still be us? <coughs> See this picture? Don't worry, we're not going to have a mini quiz at the end. I debated it. Dr. Webster told me against it, so I, I pulled it off. Um, at the time this was printed in 2010, they just went after a, f a number of the main cell systems and they said, let's see how the different pro protein coding areas or genes of the genome, let's see how well they, how much they communicate with one another, how much w one system influences another, and they said, oh no, let's go down further. Let's go down and see how much one protein coding area affects, what, what cis, cis, how many systems does one protein coding area affect, or one gene? Let, let's just try to nail it down. And, and they got this, and, and then they quit, because they said it's getting so complex. One of the experimenters, not on, one of the scientists, not on this one, but on a different graph, which I didn't show, he called it a 
horror graphed. You know, when you, would, when you go into a classroom and you have to have a test on something and someone puts up something like this, horror grips your soul. You go, I can't. This is too much. No human being can be expected to try to make sense out of this, much less memorize it. Are you crazy? That's what you're thinking to the teacher. They call it a horror graft because the more they looked, the more interconnected. And they finally walked away from it and says everything's connected to everything. You can't affect one part or one gene without affecting many other body um, functions. And if the gene is a key one, then actually you will notice a major change in the person. They'll, they'll exhibit a disease. What I want you to realize is if you start pulling out information, the whole network, just like when you have a Christmas tree, I used to, when I used to do the Christmas trees, I liked, I just keep pu putting them together, circuit after circuit after circuit. And then I'd go flip them on, nothing. Well, I knew one of those lights up there had to be changed because it was stopping the current from flowing. I soon learned to check every light before I would. I thought that was apropos since Christmas is coming up. I was trying to, you know, make it relevant. Um, this is much worse than that. We're talking about millions and hundreds of millions and probably billions of connections. Everything is built on everything else. You can't go in and slice part of it out and go, hey, we can get rid of this. Problem two, how can removal of the MGs not trigger the cell's internal shutdown programs? Okay, what I'm going to discuss here has got some big names in it. Don't let that scare you. I'm going to bring it down into normal English. It's simple to understand, but just bear with me. Where, O oh death, is thy sting? A brief review of apoptosis biology. Apoptosis is where the cell, and we'll discuss why in a minute, is triggered to start breaking itself down into its components, packaging up the components in containers, turning out the lights, dissembling the membrane, and sending those packages out to nearby cells so that they can use the equipment. It's a programmed, systematic cell breakdown and termination. You'd say, well, why would cells want to do that? Well, apoptosis was a term introduced in 1972 to distinguish a mode of cell death with characteristic morphology and apparently regulated endogenously driven mechanisms. Endogenously means from within. The effector process responsible for apoptosis are now mostly well known, involving activation of the caspases. Those are special genes that we have, or protein coding areas in our DNA. And I think there's like 14 or 15 of them, at the last I remember. At least there's 14 or 15, because I know they're numbered 1 through 14. Um, the, and so anyway, these, a, a, uh, these capsases are, are they start with one and they move all the way down. And what they tell the body is, we want you to break, start out breaking this down, number one, because we can break this down and keep the cell going for a little while. Then number second caspase is hit, and it says break down this part of the cell and take out this system, take out this system, and it goes all the way down very orderly, and then the last one turns off the lights, opens up the gates, and everything goes over to the neighbors where it can be picked up and used. Now, our problem with this is because it's, it's a great system, but if you see, uh, you see virus infection, this is how your body helps to fight virus infection. The cell knows that it's got an infection uh, because of new DNA material that comes in, and we won't go into how it knows that. But the bottom line is it says, quick, shut down before this virus can multiply into millions of more viruses and infect our neighbors. We're going to shut down. It's here. It's got through our defenses. It's in the nucleus. Shut down now. Turn off everything. Now, the viruses being the sneaky little devils that they are, pun intended, they have chemicals that they make to stop the capsaic system from kicking in. They interrupt the, the signal that's being sent to the 
the capsaicin genes to open up, start functioning, they interrupt it. You'd almost think it was planned, I'm telling you. Uh, anyway, and energy deprivation, you're suffocating, or your heart, the coronary artery is clogged off, no more blood is getting through, no more oxygen. There's hypoxia, that's what that is. Oh, but look at this one over on your left. I want to find my arrow. DNA damage. You come in and you start removing DNA, guess what it says? This is not good, shut down. We don't know what's doing it, but we're closing down the shop. Because if it's infectious, it'll take over the whole body. So if we want to walk in and start taking DNA out, because we could say, hey, we can do our own salvation here. If it, suppose we all buy this is true and we have scientists working on it. We could say, let's get rid of the heterochromatin and we're home free. Trouble is, not all the heterochromatin has all the mobile genetic elements. There's still plenty in the genome working because you and I are using it. But um, even if we could do that, we have a problem because the minute, here's the, here's the booby trap, the minute we go to pull it out, cell dies and we have to get it out of all of our cells because they communicate one cell communicates with the next year they exchange genetic material they're going to be communicating so yeah we could pull the all the heterochromatin out but there would be nothing left person would be dead um, I just sort of said that so let's move on just does scripture help us with these problems? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went with them together. Remember in Genesis 22, Abraham's waking in the middle of the night, says, Take your son, your only son. Yeah, the son that you have everything, that you and your wife treasure more than anything in the world. All your hopes are on him. Yeah, that one. That's the one. I want you to take him out, and I want you to sacrifice him. Yeah, I mean kill. And I'm going to show you where. I, I've thought about this before, and I thought, I think to a parent, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm, when I say parent, I'm talking about a parent who we would put under the category of normal parent. We do have some parents who don't want to be parents, and this wouldn't be apropos, but let's talk about an idealized parent. I think that's the one command that they would find the most difficult. I think this one is clearly top dog, worst case scenario, number one, can't do. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a ram was caught in the thicket. And, and offered him up as a burnt offering. So quickly what happened? The father and son walk up the hill. There, Mount Moriah, the clouds there. Now uh, uh, Abraham was hoping the clouds weren't there because the clouds were only there if he was supposed to do a sacrifice. And if the cloud was there, then this was God talking to him. And he's going, ah, oh, the cloud's there. This, this was God. I was hoping it was my old failing brain that was hearing voices and no it wasn't and it is going to have to go through they start climbing up they get there the son says okay what, what are we going to do for a lamb and then then the father has to tell the son oh guess what um you're the lamb all of the other patriarchs had a major major test abraham had this test jacob the night he wrestled, remember? But look at Isaac. He never, the, most people look at it, he never had a test, really, did he? I mean, he had a great life. From what we can tell from Scripture, sure he got sick, had a few ups and downs, we all do, but hey, not compared to Abraham and not compared to Jacob, he had things pretty good. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He could have said to his dad, you're crazy. I'm taking you down. We're going home, only I'm tying you up because mom needs to know what you just tried to pull off. And you're not getting out of the tent anymore. 
And by the way, I'm taking over the books. He said, okay. Pretty good test, wouldn't you say? You know, your life. Pretty. I'd put that up there. In this story, Abraham represents God, so don't jump to conclusions just yet, but God is the killing force in this story. His son, Isaac, is you and me. And the ram in the thicket is Christ. We need to keep that in mind now. And we won't answer the question of how is God the executioner until we get to the last lecture. And I ain't spoiling it. I'm just giving you a teaser. You need to come to that one to find out exactly what's being portrayed here. And don't jump to conclusions, please, until you've heard that one. Okay, we've got this in mind now. What does the Bible say about Christ's death? Let's see what it says in its own words. Remember, there was a guy in the mid-centuries, uh, in the dark, we call the Dark Ages, I think he was around 11 or 1200, his name is Anselm. He said that he tried to figure out why Christ had to die, and he came to the conclusion it was to prove that God loved us. And everyone kind of said, yeah, that sounds good. And so they were going with that principle for quite a while. I'm talking, um, well, the Catholic Church by that time had the Eucharist. So they, they were seeing things completely different. They were saying that you actually had to ingest Christ's body literally every week and drink his blood in order to get salvation. No, I won't. Um, I'm going to leave that alone. Um, anyway, he said that. And then when we came to Luther and Calvin, they said, no, no, Luther was a lawyer. He goes, this is a legal transaction. And they did a legal contract. They did a swap. They did a swap out. And that's pretty much what stayed in the churches, even to the present day, oh, with modifications, changing, and editing. But that's, that's pretty much where we are today in a broad category, if you're going to do a broad stroke. I want to suggest to you something completely different from that. And let's let the Bible, let's start by saying, what, seeing what the Bible said about Christ's death. Okay, let's go through it quickly. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, if you read that in the Greek, it says, for sin pays its wage death. So here it says it's not God that pays the wage, it's death, it's sin itself. Sin is the cause of death, God isn't. So now we've got, remember, we've got that story of Abraham back there, so we got that hanging out there. We're not going to throw any of this away. We have to use it all. We're just putting, we're, we're gathering facts right now. We're not going to come to conclusions yet. We're just fact gathering. Who, Christ, was delivered, the, the Greek word is yielded up, for our offenses, again, this Greek word means missing the mark, referring to the Hebrew way of sin, which is missing the mark, and was raised again for our justification. So he was Yielded up because of our offenses, our problems. I'm going to substitute in this paradigm. I'm going to substitute the word MGEs, mobile genetic elements. And that he was raised again for our justification. What is justification? Well, we, the, it, it's, it's often referred to as it's our, um, it's our pedigree so we can, we can get into heaven. It proves we're the real deal. It says that we are made right. It says, they're okay. Where sanctification is how you get there. Okay? You get to the place where you're right. You are righteous. That means you, everything in you is right. Every, all the systems, all the circuits are good. Everything is right. So, he two things. Christ is going to do something about our... And here it says offenses, or our misses the marks, or our, our sin or in this paradigm, our mobile genetic elements, and when he's raised again, it's going to be shown as proof that this, whatever Christ did, worked. 
and he can give it to us and therefore we can be looked upon as having it worked also because he can deliver. First question, what happened in Gethsemane and was it necessary? And the second question is, why the cross? Gethsemane, for I say to you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. We talked about this earlier. To be reckoned amongst the transgressors means you are one. For things concerning me having had a fulfillment or end, I'm going to read to you the um, analytical, literal translation. So what this is doing is it's just taken the, the um, um, Greek words and it's putting English words without tr necessarily looking to see if the perfect meaning flows in the way the interpreter or the translator thinks it should. He says, I'm just going to put it out here. If we just starkly substitute words, this is what we're going to get. For I say to you, it is still necessary, and the for means you have to add the word for in, because in Greek it jumps right to this, the saying having been written to be fulfilled in me, and he was counted with lawless ones. He was counted as being lawless. He was, he was a law, he, for all practical purposes, he's a lawless one. And also the things concerning me have an end, meaning Christ was saying, look, everything says that's said about me has to occur in me, and we're drawing to the end of my life here, so it's now going to happen. What was predicted was going to happen is going to happen now. For he has been made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Christ is going to be made sin, have sin, in this paradigm, mobile genetic elements, who really didn't do anything in any way, shape, or form to have brought this on. It was thrust upon him through Mary, and he took on our problem, but he did nothing to aid and abet it, and truly, he, he got something put upon him on this. And he came out and went, and as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said to them, Pray that you enter not in temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, if you go through the... the um, the, the Gospels never hear Christ complaining. And I would have thought one of the four, if, he, if Christ was a complainer, would have picked up some, some complaints here or there. This is the only time I ever really picked up on him complaining, asking for something for himself. So whatever is going to go on here is so bad, it's horrible, it's horrifically bad, and he's actually saying, this is really bad. Do we have to do it this way? Is there any other way around it? I am shrinking from it. I can't do it. This is, it is horrific, please. Is there any other way we can do it? We need to look at this. This is important. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was if, as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now remember something. Nobody's touching him in the Garden of Gethsemane, is it? Are any soldiers there uh, with um, swords or, or nails? Are there any thorns in his head? Is anyone beating up on him? Is anyone whipping him? What's he doing? He's praying on the grass, right? No, no one's touching him. Now I'm going to tell you something, when you're bleeding through your pores, that's a very bad thing. The only medical condition now that I think is apropos, and usually people die prior to that, is something called DIC, Disseminated Intervascular Coagulopathy. And it comes right before death. And I don't have time because it's good escaping away as it always does on me and to describe why just take my word for it or go google it um, 
it, this you know afternoon to find out what happens is the body systems are breaking down to the point where you can no longer form a blood clot because the system, your your whole body is coming a, coming apart and this is often the sign and I have seen it where pa patients are just a few short moments or hour maybe two hours away from death unless you do something if you can get in there and take care of what the problem is, you can bring them back. But if things continue on untreated, that's where they're headed, and that's what you're going to get. Now, why would that be happening? He's in the park. He's praying. Why this? And there appeared an angel from heaven strengthening him. I'm going to suggest to you that that angel came down as he's about ready to expire and says, we need to do this again tomorrow. Now, why would God have Christ go through something like this? It, this is torture. Christ, if, if you can take this cup from me, please. Is there any other way around it? Why would they put in for doing this twice? And what was going on? And what is it exactly that it's talking about here? This is very important. It's right before the next day is the cross. Why? What? Why? Well, let's go to Isaiah 53. And many were astonished at you. His visage, that's face, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. The NIV puts it this way, just as there were many who were appalled at him. In other words, if you looked at him, you were shocked. What is this? His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred behind, beyond human likeness. Now, they weren't talking about him on the cross here because the priests and rulers were laughing and says, if you can save others, why can't you save yourself? Come on down. They would have said, whoa, what's going on here? This, this is weird. Look at this. He went up on the cross a man, and now he's not a man anymore. What's going on? <coughs> I'm going to suggest to you there's only one place this could really have happened. And that was in the Garden of, Eve, Garden of Gethsemane on the night before. Why? Okay, let's go back. Remember when we were talking about uh, in um, lecture four, where the, uh, the story of the um, Garden of Eden, remember that? And as soon as they came out, what's the first thing God said when, when he starts talking? You know, Adam says, that's the woman you gave me. If you hadn't made women, I wouldn't be in this predicament. The woman says, you know, it was a snake. You made the snake. If the snake hadn't have been here, I wouldn't have done it. What does God do? He, he says, okay, I'll start with the snake. And he goes to the snake and he goes, you know, on your belly, you will, you will go for the rest of your life. Remember the MGEs, they're the, they're the only other animal out there that has the same number of MGs per capita, per nucleotide, and all that stuff. Remember that? Well, but he said something else. I'm going to put enmity between, and he's talking to the devil now, between your seed. Remember seed was the word zira in, in Hebrew, which meant as close as it, they could come to, uh, well, in Greek it's, it's translated sperma, which we get spermatozoa from. Okay, it's genetic material. I'm going to put enmity between your genetic material and her genetic material. Remember that? And then I showed you these signs about peewees that if, uh, 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 when it gets to eight cells in the new forming zygote, all of the cells, all the, D, all the chromosomes line up. They unravel. All of the, the methylation, which is the lockdowns, come off. And these little peewee, those really three enzymes, come and go up and down that genome, and they know exactly where to put the methylation marks on. The new baby is going to get a fresh new start. And if that doesn't happen, there's no zygote, there's no baby, it's done. Remember that? And about 40%, the only thing that's methylated is mobile genetic elements, nothing else, just mobile genetic elements. 
They, are no, they know how to pick those out. And of the mobile genetic elements, people have estimated that it could be somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. Some say higher. I don't know. Let's pick 40 percent. No one's got an accurate number that I can say, so let's just go with that. But about, let's just say, 40 percent of the mobile genetic elements from conception or shortly after conception are locked up. If they are not, you will never get a human being. Now, can you imagine what the devil is saying when this happens? He's going, ha, folks, he's messing with my experiment. The best part of what I was doing, he covered up. He's locked up from the get-go. You've never seen the exalted, better, better than ever deal I was offering because he's come in and messed up what I tried to do. When I was in uh, college and I was decided to go into medicine my senior year and I was taking all my pre-med courses and I was stressed and I had organic chemistry and I remember the two weeks before Thanksgiving, which is right now, many years ago, we won't give a number, uh, I was doing a two-week experiment which was, which was one of the hardest in the entire semester in organic chemistry. And it so happened that I, we had to go to use a special machine in another room. And I went into that room, and I couldn't get out because classmates were talking to me. And, and then someone slipped in ahead of me. And I was in that room about a half hour before I came out to finish out my experiment. And when I finished it out the week before Thanksgiving, it flopped. And I went to the lab instructor, and I said, I did everything exactly. I did. And he says, yeah, I know you did good work. He says, well, did you ever leave your experiment out exposed for any length of time? And I said, uh, well, I don't think so. I said, I had to go and use the mass spectrometer, and I was in there for, he says, how long were you there? I said, a half hour. He goes, someone sabotaged your experiment while you were gone. I told you to lock things up if you're going to be gone for that exact reason. I had to spend, I had to come back on Thanksgiving over Thanksgiving vacation and complete it. The devil could have called the same thing. God has come in and he's messed up the recipe and of course it looks bad. What does Christ do? He says, okay, in the Garden of Gethsemane with no one touching me, the Father is going to withdraw from me and that means, remember, if it weren't for the microRNAs keeping things locked up, remember that half the percentage come from God, percentage in this paradigm, percentage come from the other side. If God stops his custodianship of Christ's DNA and says, okay, we're going to let the stuff that was locked up, we're going to let them go. The universe gets to see what would have happened if God had not stepped in right at the garden and said, I'm going to put enmity, I'm going to put... Some, you, the DNA you're putting in this couple is not going to stand. I'm not going to let it go unchallenged. I am going to take part of it, and I am going to lock it up. Those are my words, and this is in this paradigm. The universe gets to see now what would have happened. God says, okay, now it's time to answer this question. I'm not going to ask anyone else to answer it, because in answering it, it's horrible. And Christ is dying within hours. So the wages of sin are death, aren't they? If you let everything the devil put in be expressed, you're not going to be around for a couple hours more and you're done. And we're going to explain why that all, that was the first death. We're going to, in the last lecture, we're going to explain why they also do it in the second death. Very interesting. What would have happened if had God not intervened in Genesis 3.15 by putting enmity between thy seed and her seed? Now, Christ is showing everyone in Gethsemane, no, I wasn't taking out the best stuff and just trying to make the devil look really bad. I was trying to keep the experiment going. And there's something else here, and I don't have the answer to this. I'm throwing this out for you to think about. If a lot of this stuff has been locked up since conception in every human being that's been on this earth, maybe they needed to do some things to find out exactly how that genetic material would react when removed. I don't know that. It's just an idea. 
he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify, that means to make right, many. For he shall bear their, you know what we're doing in this paradigm, mobile genetic elements. Okay, the cross. What did the scripture say about Christ's death on the cross and its relevance to our salvation? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For with, if we had been joined together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Whatever he did on the cross is going to have to happen to us. Now, I said not everything that happens on the cross, but something that happened on the cross with Christ, we're going to have to do it with him. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came on all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came on all men to justification. That means it's correct. It's, it's the right thing to do for them to have life. For then we must, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, has he appeared to put away sin, put away sin, by the sacrifice of himself. So, by sacrificing himself, there's something he can do to put away sin, to get rid of it, sin. All this foreign code. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The old man, when Paul says that, if you look at that in the Greek, it means our sinful nature. That the body of sin might be destroyed. Notice that, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That from now on we should not serve sin. He's going to get rid of it on the cross. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but have you seen any talk about exchanges or anything here? Am I missing something? Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Purged. By which, will, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. We are sanctified by something that was offered by Christ's body. I still haven't seen anything about exchange here, have you? Anything even remotely that we could say, well, maybe it means an exchange? It's all talking about getting rid of sin. By, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Until Christ came, no one really knew that you could be resurrected and that you could live eternally. The Pharisees said they thought you could, and the Sadducees said, no, you couldn't. And the high priest was always a Sadducee. And Christ answered that question. He says, yes. There can be a resurrection, there is a resurrection, and you can live forever, and I'm proof. The only way that Christ could abolish death and substitute immortal life, as well as make us perfect forever, is if he removed the MGMs, MGEs, I'm sorry, MGMs, heaven, that's wrong answer, wrong word. The mobile genetic elements from the human genome, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. We're looking at first, I'm, we're, I'm sorry, we're looking at Colossians 2. This is going to tell, this, this, this part of scripture here is going to be, is, it gets the most definitive about what happened to the cross of any that I've found. This is going to tell us something. Buried with him in baptism, 
wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. So we're going to have to do what he did, something that he did, not the whole thing. We don't have to be crucified, but something that happened on the cross has got to happen to us or we have no chance for eternal life. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh has he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. So something in our flesh and you know what circumcision stands for? It's removing the foreskin. Something needs to be cut off, right? And it's not made with hands. blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having, now this is important, I'm, this is the fifth, Colossians 2.15, and having spoiled, the American King James has the word spoiled. If you go look at the um, Greek word, it really means wholly put off from oneself. So whatever he did, he put it off from himself principalities and powers. Whenever Paul says principality and powers, he's talking about the devil and his angels. Go look at Ephesians 6 in the, in the war when you're putting on all the armor. And he calls principalities and we're fighting against principalities and powers. He made an, a show of them open, openly, triumphing over them in it. So he threw off whatever the devil and had done on him and he did it so successfully he was triumphant just like a conquering general and he out absolutely won that contest hands down circumcision means to cut made without hands so whatever is happening there Paul's saying we're not talking literal circumcision here this was done without hands this was done at a molecular level in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, of removing, and you know what we're going to put for sins, we're going to put mobile genetic elements. Now the handwriting of ordinances, some people say, well, that has to do with, uh, that means the whole Ten Commandments is gone. I'm just going to re refer you to Deuteronomy 31, 21, and 25 to 26, and there you're going to find out that the handwriting of ordinances, is, as it is called, is clearly described in this text because Moses, before he went up and, uh, and was laid to rest, he made the uh, sons of Levi write down this whole song he sang. And the, you know what the song was about? You guys are going to go into the new, uh, new Canaan and you are going to apostatize horribly. God's going to have to remove you from it. Many of you are going to die. It's going to be a failure. That was a song. And he says you have to put it on the side of the ark, not in it. And it was handwritten by the Levites and it was put on the side of the ark. And when Paul talked about removing it, what he's saying is what Christ did on the cross means that humanity in the future will never have to put up with that prediction again because it's going to be gone. We are not going to be prone to doing what the children of Israel did when they went into Canaan. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. This is when God first gave it to Abraham. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart See, in the Old Testament, it's talking about circumcising your heart, cutting something. And Well, back then they thought the heart was the seat of emotions. We know the brain is, so let's just put the word brain in there. And the Lord your God will circumcise your brain and, and the brain of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Obviously, whatever is circumcised can be passed on. It's hereditary. So if it's hereditary, it's got to be either in the sperm or the egg. We don't have any other choices there. Those are the two, only two options we have. And all, with all your soul that you may live. So we're not given a lot of leeway here. Whatever this circumcision is, it's done in our cells. It's passed on. It has to be in the DNA. And we've already identified the mobile genetic elements, haven't we? Ad, you, some of you may say ad nauseum. And we have also pointed out what they do with the microRNAs, right? 
in the blood and now actually working on the DNA. So you need both. If you don't have both, you aren't going to get a chance to get rid of them. And here in Exodus, what he's saying is, is you can't sit down at the Passover feast if you haven't been circumcised. I don't care if you're a good standing foreigner who's come in and joined. If you haven't been circumcised, you can't sit down. What is the wedding? What is the uh, Passover feast an indication of? The wedding feast of the Lamb. You can't sit down at that feast if you haven't been, if your mind, if your heart hasn't been circumcised. If you haven't gotten rid of these mobile genetic elements, you can't be there. I was going to spend a long time telling you about circumcision, but time won't allow me, but I'm going to put up these. Um, uh, if you take in, in Africa, if they circumcise males, the incidence of contracting or spreading HIV drops by 50%. The foreskin is found to be a very poorly engineered piece of, body, of the body. Uh, it has dendritic cells, which are nerve cells, which are deformed. The, the, the dendritic cells com communicate with the immune system. And the bottom line is if you have an uncircumcised male, he is far more likely to pick up sexually transmitted disease and to pass it on. Because this foreskin is so poorly engineered and it's so easily, it, it becomes an antenna or a magnet for microRNAs, which we talked about are exchanged during intercourse, but any, anything, any viral, sexually transmitted disease, or bacterial. Because it doesn't have a good defense system. It isn't architecturally like the rest of the body. So we look very carefully in the DNA. Is there, is there evidence that mobile genetic elements could have been the cause of Males growing foreskins. Well, there is a mobile genetic element that's right upstream, but no one's done the experiment or looked to see whether it causes it or not, so we don't know. But given what the Bible tells us, I would like to suggest to you that it is. Now, does this start making sense? Why would God have instituted what most people think is barbaric? Um, Circumcision of males represents a surgical vaccine against a wide variety of infections, adverse medical conditions, and potential fatal diseases over their lifetime, and also protects their sexual partners. The benefits vastly outweigh its risks. The enormous public health benefits include protection from urinary tract infections, sexually transmitted HIV, human papillomavirus, syphilis, Shankroid, penile and prostate cancer, phimosis, thrush, inflammatory dermatoses. In women, circumcision of the male partner provides substantial protection from cervical cancer and chlamydia. And the, this article goes on and on. The foreskin is a disease breeding ground. And if you want to pass it on or pick it up, it's your best, it's your best chance. And you want it there if your whole idea is to spread mobile genetic elements. And I was going to go why that works, don't have time, we're going to move on. Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and no longer be stiff-necked and they uh, uh, this was uh, published in 207, declining rate of male circumcision immense increasing evidence of its public health benefit. And we're stiff-necked people. We haven't changed. Exactly what happened on the cross, we don't know. And we may never know how God pulled off removing all of that heterochromatin. I don't know. And it may well be something we'll never know because he may have done it in ways that we can't comprehend. And we don't, we no one saw a cross die. So you, people say, well, it, what happened in Gethsemane couldn't have happened on the cross. Guess what? We don't know. The three hours before he died, when all of this would have been open and being worked on, no one saw him. He was hid from the sixth hour. There was darkness all over the land to the ninth hour when he died. I'm suggesting to you that what was happening on the cross was God was providing the ram 
human beings would not be required to go through what would be an excruciating death while the ways of which the, to remove this mobile genetic elements could be finally perfected. And I, and I say this absolutely with the utmost reverence, and I'm not using this word in any way to be, to be in any way uh, uh, negative. Christ became the guinea pig for the whole human race. He went what would have been all of our doom. He took it to find an answer for us. And that is profound. And I'm sorry I had to use the word guinea pig, but it's the only word I could come up with that I thought you could all, we could all understand the meaning. Because... This act is, is beyond expression. Somebody had to die, not because God said so, but because the only way out required it. Had there been another way, God would have done it. This is bad stuff. Christ on the cross was treated by God as an unrepentant sinner. What was God's cry to God as he was dying on the cross? Was Christ saying on the cross, please stop torturing me. The heat here is tremendous. You're burning me. Stop it. Please. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left? Why are you not sustaining me more? Why are you not sustaining my, sustaining my genome? Mobile genetic elements are now running completely free and wild. Nothing's locked up anymore. It has to be that way because God has to know where they all are so he can remove them. And they have to find a way to remove them and still keep the person that they're removed from viable. And there's billions of things going on here. So you can say, oh, God could figure it out. There are so many things that are moving. These mobile genetic elements will move up to the last second. He's got to find a way to get to it that's beyond just, oh, I know it's, it's quadrant four, section five. He's got to find how this thing works from its very bottom up. And Christ says, I'll be the guinea pig. I'll be the guinea pig. And again, I say that with absolute reverence. How do we know God was Christ? How do, you, how do we know they were successful? In the end of the Sabbath, well, let me go down. And it, behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. When, when Gabriel came down to call the sun, he came down in the glory of heaven. It, it blew 300 soldiers to the ground. They couldn't even stand up. This is power, and this is the ultimate proof that it worked. And you'll find out why in the last lecture. This is the absolute total proof. And guess what? When he said in John 14, the devil has nothing more in me, what happened from that minute on? They went out to Gethsemane, and he was tortured for... 24, well, 30, 20, 20 hours nonstop. That's stressing the system far beyond what you and I would ever be asked to stress it. And he didn't murmur. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't make one complaint. The system works. He proved it before he died. And when it, after he re, was removed and he was resurrected, it was the absolute ultimate proof. All the MGs are gone. The, whatever he rewrote, whatever he did, it works like a charm. You can stress it to death, and the person who has that code won't blink. The universe can now look and say, OK, I was really worried about Bob Melashango coming up, but I know that when Christ is formed in him, when he gets this code, I know he's going to act like Christ, and he can be my neighbor. 
He is justified to come up. This isn't Christ coming up to the Father and saying, please, can, you know, John Doe is such a nice guy, and, and God the Father goes, well, I don't know. You know, he's had some really rough spots. I've been seeing, oh, please, just for me, please, don't you like me, can't you? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's Christ is going to the Father and saying, we're really in a rough spot right now, but let me show you with a genome. Let me show you what we've got planned. And he's agreed to do it. And the Father looks at that and says, boy, that looks good. You bet. Bring him up. Not because of what John Doe did, but because John Doe has made a a, a, an agreement, a contract with God, a covenant. He's covenanted with God. Says, we're, I'm going to be here. You're going to work on me until we're done because I want that end almost as much as you do. And I'm not going to move. I'm going to stay under. And you're going to work on me. And you're going to get me there. That's what we're headed for. And so heaven can look at this and say, they really look bad right now, but we see Christ is going to be formed in them, and we've got no problems. Look what Christ did before he died when he was tortured for 20 hours. What did he do to the people who were putting the nails through his hands? He was praying for them. Incredible. And this is God's glory. So, if Christ is not raised, your faith is in vain, you are in your sins. You have fallen. If, if Christ is not resurrected, all of this is worthless. That means it didn't work. And here's the final slide. Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. However they did this, they pulled it off without changing God's, Christ's personality. He this is a miracle of all miracles. How could they have removed that much DNA material and still have it be Christ when all was said and done? And that one I don't think we'll ever understand. Okay, let's have prayer. Our Father, as we look over what the great sacrifice that all heaven made to rehabilitate our human race, we are speechless. And how cavalierly we treat it, we are embarrassed. Regenerate, reinvigorate us with the Holy Spirit. Let us see that we are naked and clotheth, we pray. Amen.